Okay, so a little while ago, I presented um, some of the main behavioral economic phenomena and findings and things as post-it notes on Twitter, I presented them on Twitter. And the hope was, <clears throat> was that it would give more people sort of a, a basic understanding of some of, some of the main behavioral economic um, um, observations and uh, ideas. Uh, and the purpose of that really was that if we could, or if I could try to convey some of these ideas to a broader section of the population, if they read these, <laughs> if they looked at these post-its, then people would see that behavioural economics is, is all around them, really. Uh, what I thought I'd do is just give very brief, sort of verbal, oral explanations of the post-it notes um, in these little videos. I'll keep them to just a few minutes each one. Um, hopefully so that people, you know, who don't really, or being introduced to behavioural economics get a better understanding of the post-it notes. That's the purpose. If I fail, then I won't have wasted too much time. So this first one, this was um, Behavioural Economics on the Post-it number one. It's called the Allais Paradox, uh, named after Maurice Allais, a very famous economist, French economist, who presented these ideas um, in the early 1950s. And really, I think that these were probably the first empirical observations in what later became known as um, behavioural economics. Uh, and the Allais Paradox is proven to be very uh, influential. So, um, just to demonstrate what this is, you can sort of ignore all these options down here. Just look at A and B, options A and B, and you can consider these to be almost like little lottery tickets. Actually, A isn't really a lottery ticket. A is just a situation where you would be given £1 million for sure. We, just, we could just give you £1 million. That would be A. Or you could choose B instead, which is like a little lottery ticket. If you choose B... Uh, there's an 89% chance that you could win a million pounds. There is a 10% chance that you could win a five million pounds. But there is a 1% chance that you could win nothing at all. So Ali said, Maurice Ali said, you could, if you present these choices to, this choice to individuals, most people would plump for the certainty, the one million pounds for sure. They would be put off a bit, I guess, by the 1% of getting nothing if they went for B. Uh, and that sort of holds up reasonably well in empirical observations over the years. There's been uh, dozens of studies on the LA pa paradox, maybe hundreds, if you count the unpublished ones as well. That generally holds up. People tend to choose A over B often. Now forget about A and B, consider C and D. These are, and the reason why I put a tick there is that I'm just, and across there is because mo, you know, the, the idea is that Ali proposed that most people would go for A rather than B. Um, C versus D. Here, you can consider these to be two, like two little lottery tickets. So C is an 11% chance that you could get £1 million, but there's an 89% chance that you'd get nothing at all. Or you could go for D. If you go for D, there's a 10% chance that you'll get £5 million, but there is a 90% chance that you could get nothing at all. Okay. Now, what Ale proposed is that in that situation, I guess he, he speculated that most people would be enticed by the you know the higher outcome if you do win and what may be perceived to be by most people to be quite a small difference in the chances of winning a 10 percent versus an 11 percent chance so essentially propose that most people would choose d over c in that instance Oops, sorry about that so when you consider these two together these two choices together Ali's proposing that many people would go for a and then d in those choices right now we can rewrite these 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 options here a b c and d we can rewrite them in a slightly different format all right so just consider the bottom half of the of the post-it note b is written in the same way don't worry that i've crossed things out for the moment there but b is written in the same way you can see 89 percent chance of one million pounds five ten percent chance of five million pounds or one percent chance of nothing but you can rewrite a so it's an 89% chance of £1 million and an 11% chance of £1 million. That is to say it's a 100% chance, a certainty of £1 million. And you can similarly rewrite C and D. So in this instance, C is written in exactly the same way, 11% chance of a £1 million and an 89% chance of nothing. 
Um, D, we can rewrite, so it's a 10% chance of five million pounds, and then a 1% chance of nothing, and an 89% chance of nothing, i.e. a 90% chance of nothing. Now, what Ali suggested was that rational, what's called rational um, choice theory, or even standard economic theory, the main way that economists do things is that irrelevant, uh, is that common outcomes across two options when you're making a choice should be considered irrelevant by the individual making that choice, right? So look at the choice between A and B again here. When you rewrite them in the way that I've just suggested, you can see that they share an 89% chance of one million pounds, right? So according to what's called the independence axiom, don't worry about the names, <laughs> that particular outcome should be considered to be irrelevant by the individual. So they'll be making their choice essentially between considering the 11% chance of one million pounds and the 10% chance of five million and the 1% chance of nothing, right? That, that you can consider 89% chance of one million is irrelevant because it's shared by both options. Similarly, if you look between the choice between C and D, that share, they share an 89% chance of winning nothing. So the individual should consider that as irrelevant as well. So if you cross out those common consequences, you can see that A, 11% chance of 1 million is identical to C, 11% chance of 1 million. And B, 10% chance of 5 million, 1% chance of nothing, is identical to D, 10% chance of 5 million, 1% chance of nothing. So what that means, according to standard economic theory, an individual that chooses A over B should always choose C over D, because if the common consequence is irrelevant, then these choices are identical. If they choose B, over A, they should always choose D over C. Or they should be always indifferent between the two choices, i.e. they should consider A the same as B and C the same as D right, in their preferences. So you can see the fact that Ali proposed that most individuals would actually choose A over B and then D over C violates that assumption that's embedded in standard economic theory or standard rational choice theory. It violates the assumption of independence. So, and that's basically just what I've written here, right? So the probable explanation for this is that people put an enormous weight upon certainty, a very heavy weight upon certainty, uh, when risk can be avoided, right? And that steers them, if you like, to ch towards choosing the certain option A over here, over the risky option B here. And there's probably very good evolutionary explanations for why individuals do that. Anyway, I said I'd keep it short. That's the Allé paradox, one of the fundamental findings, <laughs> I think, in the history of behavioural economics. And that assumption that, it, that people do violate independence, what's called independence, that people don't consider common consequences to be irrelevant, plays a part in some of the later um, uh, proposals and uh, ideas and results that have been gathered by uh, behavioural econ economists ever since.